This is Deep Geeking, the Community Media Archive. We're going to show you some pretty interesting things this morning. Uh, I'm Randy Van Dalsen. It says we the media.tv. I'm also with the Busky Group, but one thing I do on the side when I don't have to do this incredibly boring consulting work is do a, a television series that has been going on since 2005, a weekly two hour program that. I'll get into it a little bit when it's my turn to run through a bunch of different things that we do with that show via the internet department. With us also today is Ann Tice of Denver Open Media. She is in charge of dealing with uploading lots of programs. I think you pay our little leader right now. They have over 5,000 programs archived at the internet archive right now. And then there's our guru in all of this activity. The geek that we're trying to be. The real geek. geek of this thing, who you, if you want to get involved with your programming being archived at the Internet Archive, this is the man you would like to interface with. He has just been wonderful for people like me as an individual producer to work with, and, and someone like Ant, who's probably a lot like some of you in this room who work for a media center is considering this. Speaking of you in this room, let's get a little bit of information about who you are, what your interest is in this session. Have you ever uh, used the, or checked out the Internet Archive? Do any of you actually upload anything there yet? Anything like that line? Oh, we start over here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sally Ring. I work at the um, Business Media Center. Hello, I Just one point here. This this uh, 
this slide reference here, uh, Google and then that URL, it's also on the white uh, flip chart there, that's a copy of the slides and it goes to the Community Media Archive wiki. So if you think, if you want to find out information about the Community Media Archive and how I've worked with it over the last five years, just think to yourself, Community Media Archive wiki. You type that into Google, you'll go there, all my presentation stuff is there. And that serves as a framework. There are some extra links there that will help you, you know, you can wind up kind of digging in and looking at those links. And so this is a resource. You'll have all the slides from past presentations and some more information. Just real briefly, I want to let you know what the Internet Archive is. How did this ever show up in the first place? Uh, it was because uh, uh, one of those dot-com billionaires, and the dot-com era was, what, in the 90s or something like that, where a lot of, some people made a lot of money, including this gentleman called Brewster Kale, and that's K-A-H-L-E. He decided, because he has, has this uh, absolute warm spot in his heart for the, the classic Alexandria Library, which was set up to be the, the repository of all human knowledge. Well, that's his model for this thing he calls the Internet Archive. And you can actually go visit this place. If, I don't know if any of you were here at the, the National Conference of the Alliance over in San Francisco, but a bunch of us crammed into the Internet Archive and all had our jaws dropping all around, all on the ground as we toured this amazing place. But they are doing amazing things at, that, at, that, at the Internet Archive. And one of the things that they are so interested in is the video history, the video history of our culture of this country, which is certainly part of what we are all about. The Internet Archive, uh, when you go to it online, looks something like this. There are all these different collections, and they are, it is enormous amount of stuff that's being collected. By the way, it is all free. There is no charge for what we are about to show you that each of us is doing in our different ways and what still could be done. Uh, one of the many collections of this uh, Internet Archive is a thing that this great guy over here, John, worked on with, directly with the people at the Internet Archive to set up, and it is the Community Media Archive. That is us people. And as, you, as we scroll down the Community Media Archive, you can see what are called sub-collections. These are individual places like Access Humble, where John works. They have over 4,100 programs up there right now that you can easily access and watch. Um, there are, let's see here, just, oh, as you can see, there's a lot of different places in here, and if I keep scrolling down, there's this thing called the, oh, I'm too far, Open Media Project, our fearless leader right now with over 5,300 programs that are uploaded, stored, or ready access for whoever wants. And then once in a while, there will be this thing called an individual program. And that's, here's a program that I've been producing for quite a while. We've got, it's a weekly two hour long program that has been done since 2005. And here's our page for this program, it's called Media And uh, we've got a couple hundred programs there. And I'll just click on one over here that's in the spotlight. This is one that featured uh, Amy Goodman that we did. And you can see there's a big description about it. And then there's this little viewer here. And what's cool is the Internet Archive automatically sets up so that when you click on this page and want to watch a show, you can watch it on any device you know, that they're aware of right now. Anything from an Android to an iPod, or excuse me, to an iPhone, to a tablet, to a PC, to a Mac, they all work on this. And uh, there's just a bunch. And, and you have here also a MPEG-2, it says right there, right? Yeah. You can download broadcast quality copy of this program and put it into your system for telecast. The whole two hour long show, it's about four gigs. So it might take a little while to download it. But then, uh, oh, and then other cute little things like, say if you're a producer of a show and they say, hmm, let's look at my shot every so often. Maybe I, maybe I should think about putting more variety in my shots. It's just some interesting, funky little <laughs> things that are part of this that I, I have a lot of fun with. And, or maybe if it's in black and Yeah, or sometimes, you know, 
uh, some of our the producers that are part of our team, like, let's hold up the tape and let's you know let's take a look at your storyboard that this creates of how your show looks. And say, hmm, maybe we want to have some more colorways, that kind of thing. Anyhow, I'm going to show you something kind of different along with this because one of the things that I, as a producer, do every week or so is I upload a two-hour-long video. And I want to show you just how easy that is to do via the Internet Archive. And again, I'm just using my, my PC at the office. I set it up, start uploading, and then go back to my day job while it's happening in the background. But all you do is, when, if you are set up to be one of these folks, is you click this Upload button. And you get this. Share your files. I want to do that. I want to upload file. And then it says drag and drop files here. It's way too easy. And I just set up a video of our wonderful George Stoney, uh, the father, grandfather, whatever, of public access. And when I click on that and click open, the Internet Archive automatically sets it up to, to get it ready to be stored on my collection. Well, I can tell it to go on my collection. I'll just call this uh, Stoney Short uh, so I can change the title from what they defaulted to. They've, they've given it a, a, a URL. Description, I can type any little description I want to of the content of the show, um, which for, for my regular weekly program, I just simply copy and paste the whole thing that I send out via email to the people who, who are on my email list of, here's the description of the content of the next program, and it's very easy, you know, and random. <coughs> Since this show, since his show is an aggregation of segments, <coughs> he's got detailed information about each segment in the show, what the run length is, what the what the description is. So you can preview. He does a really good job of calling out what's in this episode, what the segments are in each episode. And, so, uh, and then also, by the way, a lot of that is uh, searchable by all these keywords. And, you know, what, what do you want to look for? What's of interest to you? So anyway, back to the upload. So you, you fill in uh, the description. Hey, that's some keywords for that search that I just showed. The stuff, the stuff in red is required, or if it's got a red asterisk, that means you have to put something in there. And then, so description is required. If he tries to upload it without a description, it's not going to work. Yeah. If he doesn't put subject tags in there, it's not going to work. Because nobody needs video without descriptive information. It doesn't do anybody any good. Nobody's ever going to find it again. And that's really one of the things that we're trying to get people to do is describe their video so that it can come out of this ocean of thousands of videos so that your video, it's not just an archive for you, you stick it in the attic and never accessing it again. It's retrievable and shareable by other people. And then is, there's a, one of these other required spots is which collection you're going to get. Well, I'm putting it in the Media Edge sub-collection. It automatically knows where that is as a subgroup of the community media archive. And only Randy is authorized to upload yeah. to that, so that if you notice that, this guy. it would wind up in his drop-down list. These are the generic ones. You can't really see this. But the first one here is the one that he's authorized to upload to. And then um, license. And what I typically do on ours is I go to a, give it a Creative Commons, Commons license, and I prohibit for commercial use. So that means this stuff that's available out there for people to use as long as they use it for non-commercial purposes. Go, go ahead. All right. And yes. This is, what does remixing mean? Remixing. That Allow. means that you can take it and basically like a DJ, you can like mix it up from scratch and you know create, like, your, like, own. create your own. Yeah. Like like it's it's it. actually the derivatives. There's if you don't allow uh, remixing, it says NE for no derivatives which means the people can use your entire thing, but they can't cut large chunks out and use it in a remix. And require share alike down here? If, uh, yeah. If you, if, you, if you click on allow remixing, then that pops up. You yeah, so that means like if I put whatever license, if I say non-commercial and mm -hmm. you take some peace of mind, then you have to also say non-commercial. You can't, you can't change re change it, it has to keep the same, the same contract or the same license all the way along the line. And then what's the difference between Creative Commons and Public Domain? Public Domain, you're giving up all rights to the item. People can do anything. Yeah. It's a free-for-all, yeah. basically. Right. Okay. I got so, a quick question. Yeah. How, do you, so how do you get 
how do you get uh, like how do you sign up and get qualified? Do you need like have like a do you need to have an access station and everything to do this? <laughs> Is there a credit check? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you have to send me your credit card. And <laughs> you have to have gone out drinking with me. <laughs> if if you win something in that the raffle last night, you have to give it to John. <laughs> but Randy, enjoy sure. your Kindle. <laughs> There's no requirement to have to upload into a collection. You can register an email address and password with the Internet Archive and you're automatically able to upload into that general video collection. If you want a collection as an access center and you want it to be a sub-collection of the Community Media Archive, there's about four pieces of information. I've, I've got an email template that tell, basically tell us the title of your collection that you want, give us your logo, give us a little descriptive blurb, uh, give us the email addresses of the people you want to be able to administer that collection, and then the last thing is if you want to upload high quality MPEG-4 H.264 videos, so say you're already producing H.264 videos like most of us are, and you want an MPEG-2 version derived by archive, then there's a, a secret magic code word that you wind up specifying, and they wind up uh, on your collection. If you upload an MPEG-2, they take your MPEG-2, if you upload another format, they'll go ahead and derive the broadcast quality, NTSC, ACM, server standards, working group compliant thing, so that your show can be downloaded and played back by any other access center. And that happens just by you. And if we gave you those four things, then we'd have a slot in that, uh, that list. Yes. Right there. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And we tell them the other rule that you said. Uh, which, which one? Of them? 18 the rule? months. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you really need to be you really need to be <laughs> ready to upload. So we, you need to be ready to upload. All. We don't want a lot of blank links, and we have some here, but we don't want people get fired up and then they never follow through. Right. Well, they don't know what the next thing is. So you need to have some shows. You're, it's very simple to get started, and so when you're ready to get started, and you're actually have some shows that you want to upload. Then we can go through the process. All right. And there are no costs. There are no. This is all free because my budget is about free, so I'm into free. So as opposed to other efforts that have been done like this, because again, when I first started, I was distributing it around about ten stations via DVD, and that, you know that's, that's a cost out of my pocket. I didn't like that. But then uh, this guy came to the rescue a few years ago, and I've been uploading it that way ever since. All right. So after I'm I like what I got. If I put in a disposable weather, say something here, well, that means this is a test. And uh, nice description around. Uh, well, so this is people need to have items. This is going to be very temporary, people. Well, because I can, I can later, as the administrator of this, I can delete stuff and I can change the description. I can go. If I put a typo in there somewhere, I can go <coughs> and change it. That's key. You don't need to be perfect. Metadata and descriptive information standards change over time. You don't have to get it right the first time when you're uploading. You can go back and change it through their web interface. So anyway, when I'm when I like what I've got, it's uh, ready to go. It's already again automatically grabbed that file, which was on the desktop of this computer, this spelling.mpg. By the way, it's got to be an mpg or other. No, what does that mean? Oh, don't don't get it. All right, I'll, I'll cover that later. Okay. <laughs> Upload and create your item, and then here it goes. And it's uh, <coughs> now it's the infamous you know page boy file. Your page is being created and. You can see its progress is doing pretty well here, and it's probably going to be done very shortly. Anyway, and then what will happen is uh, in the very near future, along with uh, my, the other shows that I've already uploaded fast, uh, uh, that thing that I'm uploading will be put on top of this list of the, in the this just in area. So. One thing that I will say as a producer, if you have content, and there is there are uh, opportunities sometimes, or situations sometimes, where you might, in a, in a, if you do a program that's including content where the provider of that content to you uh, might not want it to be posted on the internet. They will say, okay, you put it on a public access channel, but not on the internet. Then what do you do? Well, I can't post it to the media, to the internet archive, so what do I do to get it to the stations for distribution <laughs> rather than sending it to well, there's this thing that I do called use of uh, the, the, the Google Google Drive. You get, uh, which is 
Well, you get 15 gigs for free now, so I can probably store there about three of my programs, but it, it doesn't happen that often where I will get content uh, into my magazine format program, which was, which either, that our stuff is either we locally create it or we obtain it from other sources. And one wonderful source of interesting content is the Media Education Foundation, who will have some pretty pricey videos, but we have a local person who buys them. And then puts them into these shows, but uh, again, uh, they cannot be posted on the uh, Internet Archive. So you come up with other solutions for that. I can, if you want more information, talk to me later about that. So anyway, um, let's see what's happening over here. Geez, well, the Stony video has been uploaded already. Um, you can see it's already beginning to do its its thing. It's very shortly you're going to see a big screen pop up in here with uh, with the viewer of it. But meanwhile, as I mentioned to you a second ago, well, the thumbnails are starting to pop up. There's George, and you can go take a look at all the different shots in this video of him. This is just amazing. And then uh, if I need to, for whatever reason, I can click over here on this item manager, and I can go edit some of the content that I put in there, which was not much in this case. That's but, actually other edit items, not item manager, uh, which is if you oh, scroll I'm sorry, down, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> really change the metadata. There's serious magic in item manager. You don't want to wind yeah, up yeah, poking yeah. buttons yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. What you're doing. Especially the biggie is called Make Dark, which I will be doing to this video later. Because it's you know it's not one of our shows anyway. Um, that's all there too. And so that's from the perspective of an individual producer how easy it is for me to set it up. And of course, by the way, that means I have got this humongous archive of all our programs available on demand for anybody to look at at any time. I can you know, geez, scroll down here and take a look at who knows what. Just you know, pop one at random. And so, comes. so they can, uh, a person on the other end can choose to view it there. Yep. Or where, where the where the play button is. Yep. Or they can down. download the entire content. Yeah. Right there. To their system, and then watch it later on their own personal. Well, in the case of the MPEG two, if you're downloading it, you nobody would want to watch the MPEG two version because it takes up a lot of space. But if you want to rebroadcast that, you want to grab the MPEG-2. And so you download the MPEG-2 version, and then you ingest it into your playback service. I see. OK. So again, then it's playing. There it is. Uh, but that's what, what I do with our affiliated stations. I send them an email that gives them the link to that MPEG-2 download. So they get the email, they click on it, it automatically starts setting up for their download to their server and off the line. But again, for a producer, one of the biggies for me is just God, all these things are available. And of course, at a huge scale, that Anne is about to talk about all the programs that they have uploaded to the Internet Archive are available also for people to watch at any time. So let's go listen to Anne for a while. And you want to you want access to this, don't you? Really? And this. I'm going to de-plug and move around. All right. Well, I'm going to just start by talking about our history and kind of how we got to the archive, because you guys are probably kind of in that place right now where you maybe you've tried some things, you're doing different things. It sounds like some of you guys have storage issues and all that. So this is kind of, I'm going to talk about how we got to where we are today. Um, Um, 
we had a system that was a non-Drupal website that we used to run our whole station. Um, and we were using um, the Teleview system and we were using like a proprietary encoding system. So we, everything was all online, everything was digital, but we stored everything in-house. Um, we had all of our streaming files because every single of our, one of our shows is um, available on our, on our website as on-demand files. We were storing all the broadcast files um, and they were all being encoded in-house. So this thing would like clog up, I'd have to clog it. It was just like a nightmare, basically. Um, so we knew we had to like look at some different solutions. So um, when we got the Knight Foundation grant, like about $400,000 to redo everything that we were doing in Drupal, um, we kind of moved a different direction. We still didn't have this relationship with Archive yet. Um, but we were working kind of internally. We had Drupal modules that would you know, do the same thing but moving stuff around. Um, they're very clunky modules. It just, again, just problems, 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 moving files around. It's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so we just trying to replicate things that are being done on this massive scale like in an archive in your little center, we found is just a kind of a waste of time because we're never gonna match the power of what Google has or even archive has. So, um, so all these different problems, we decided to look for some other solutions, and that solution was the archive solution. So um, in 2010, we actually um, got rid of the Media Mover module, moved to archive, built some other modules to interact with archive, and the way it was working at our station at the time with this solution was that People would come into our station, they would ingest their content, so they use like MPEG stream clip if they have like a DVD to rip their files, and we had like various different formats that it would work with, and then they basically just dumped um, that show, that show file, into an ingest server. So once it went in there, we had something pick it up, a script would come by and say, hey, there's a new file in here, and it would say, okay, you gotta go to archive. And it shipped it off to archive, and then archive the process that you just saw Randy do right now, it would do that for every single video that comes into our station. But the thing that would be different from Randy's is that it didn't just sit there and just live in archive. Uh, we actually, our Drupal system went back out and said, oh, look, you know, this thing's done and it's gonna like put the files back that we need where we need them so we can play them out. So that MPEG2 file that you saw there, that actually is an ACM server standard video that actually comes back to live in our video archive so that we could then play it off of our, uh, at the time it was a Telby system. Um, and then it actually would also take the H.264 file derivative and embed it into our website. So we have this, uh, so this is, so this is our collection on Archive. So it's, you know, it's good, everything's there. It's not necessarily the prettiest interface. Um, so what we have on our site, so this is our website, and here's our archive on our site. So we have all of these videos here. Everything here is identical to what you're gonna see on the archive site. Every single most recent, it's gonna match up exactly if you line up our, our, our collection on our site in chronological order. So we were able to give this more pretty interface um, to it and so this is like what someone's show page looks like. This is actually um, from the archive. So we actually, instead of just putting the raw embed code from there, we actually put it in a JW player just to wrap it and make it look nicer and it just like works a little bit better with our system. And then it just plays, but this is actually streaming from the archive directly. And all of this information is here. So you're clicking a link directly to the archive and you have to click on that. Yeah. So this is the player is a JW player, but it's this file that's actually directly from archive. So it's not taking any of your hardware space at your site. It's just in the cloud over there. Exactly. So then we didn't have to store all of those streaming files. We didn't have to like do our system to make all that streaming junk work, which is a lot of work. Um, we just have everything that we need from archive. 
no terab no four terabyte devices uh, on this stuff? Well, I mean, we have about 200 terabytes of grades, <laughs> but, um, but we archive a lot of different things, yeah. but it's not our streaming files, that's for sure. We don't need a, like, another RAID just to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Strange technical question. Does, uh, when, when they're streaming back from archive, does that stream come to your website servers first, or does it go directly to the client side host? So, I think it's bandwidth just, wise. It, it's from it's the archive. Right. It's from the archive of the client. Directly to the client. Okay, thank you. Which is why I started this in the first place, is we were too cheap and too poor to afford bandwidth for video on demand. Okay. And so, we transferred that to the archive by uploading the files to the archive. Thank you. Yeah, so when we when we made this switch, um, there we go. Um, so when we made this switch, this is, if you guys know, Alexa.com kind of ranks websites online. So you can see this flat line here all the way up until 2010 when we switched over to Archive. And then that's what our Google indexing looked like after we switched to Archive. Because um, we, I mean, when we switched over, we already had like a couple thousand videos that we started with. So we went through this long process of everything that we had internally moving it over to archive. But once we had all of those videos up there, you know, anytime that somebody does a Google search, it's like the top thing for that person's show always comes up for either Internet Archive, then Broke Media Collection, or directly to our website. So that it, happens within two hours of a, it's really quick. A show goes up to archive. And Google is hitting archive all the time. Archive is feeding stuff to Google all the time. So you get way better search ranking because of your association with archive than you do your own site. Oh. Uh -huh. How does all the metadata get there through your Yeah, it just gets pushed. It just it's this part. It just takes whatever the producer puts in our show page, and I'm going to show you that in a minute, like what they fill out on our side instead of what Randy did. Um, but yeah, it's it makes it it takes it all. Um, where there's a little glitch in our system right now, where it actually isn't going over there, but that's going to be corrected really soon. Um, but historically, it, it all the metadata goes over there. So I think you know in our system, you have to figure out like if you're going to do a solution where you're trying to create this kind of like wrapper, this website where you're doing it and you're pushing that stuff, you have to link up the field. So when we originally switched to archive, we did have to look at, okay, we didn't have originally a producer field. We just had our user ID attached to everything. So we had to create a field and tell, ask producers to make sure you fill out the producer field because otherwise that information won't go to archive. Archive doesn't like that. They want all those fields there. Um, same thing, like, you know, we have, thing called uh, theme block and they don't have that. So how do we translate, you have to kind of say, I want this thing to go into that field and that's gonna be that part of that metadata. Super cool question, Dom. So I'm kind of getting a little confused. So with the, do you, do you upload an H.264 to the, to the archive and then the archive encodes it into an MPEG-2 and then you take the MPEG-2 and then put that on your server? That's yes. Well, that's how we did do it. We so, do it differently now, okay. but um, but yeah, essentially there's some file, it doesn't have to be an H.264, but yeah, your file, we were sending files uh, that before playback, so just the raw file that our producer was giving us and sending it there and then Archive was using its encoding process that's way better, creating all these different derivatives and then sending us back just the broadcast file that we needed and that we started on our video archive to play out on Princeton or whatever Think about that. That's what's great about that is that they've moved archiving from the tail end of the dog that nobody ever gets around to doing. They've embedded it in their production process now. So, so archiving happens in in, the, in that case she was describing. Archiving happens before playout. But so, so what role is replace your encoding program? But do you guys do your encoding before you upload it? Now? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, let, yeah. Let me get to Sorry that. About that. So. <laughs> Keep going. So, so, yes, and keep <laughs> yes. uh, so um, OMP2, so this new version of the website that you just saw now, um, it's the new Drupal 7 modules. We've changed a lot of things, and um, we've actually moved to a tightrope server right now. And, um, and not that we're against Telview or anything, but they just were willing to work with us in terms of having like very open APIs and stuff. Um, so we've actually changed that process a little bit. 
So now the producer, when they submit their um, file, it has to be in the correct specs that actually goes into the tightrope system. The tightrope system validates the file to begin right. with, and so once we know that we have a valid broadcast file, then it sends it off to archive and does the rest of it. And then, it's, then it still sends back the um, streaming file, so we still it's still part of our process. It's just we're not getting our um, MPEG-2 from it anymore. Okay. Because I mean, one of the I mean, mostly it, for mo the most part, it worked really fine. But for our producers, we actually allow our members to self-schedule through our website when it's, you know when they submit their shows. So for them, it was a really frustrating process because they would submit their video, and depending on the queue that was at archive, and not just our queue, but like the world of people submitting content, you know, you might get a file ready to uh, play back in an hour or two, or it could be. 24 or more hours. There was sometimes days when there was a backlog. To get that MPEG-2 out. Yeah, to get the MPEG-2 back. Yeah. And it, so it was just getting frustrating for people. Or if it failed for some reason, it would take them days to realize that it failed. So this, now we change the process so that the playback um, sort of checks it first. So we know instantly there's something to play back, and then it's, then it's going out and then getting that streaming file. So if the streaming file doesn't come back, then we know that there's a problem somewhere else in the archive system or with the transmission of the file back and forth or whatever. Um, but that hasn't really actually been a problem. So, um, did, so did you have? Okay. So, how do you command your tightrope to send that file out? So, um, do you, anybody knows Ray Tiley over at um, Tightrope? He's a developer over there. He's really great. He's been involved in public access for a long time. And he's just really excited about this project. So he built this whole module called the Media Sherpa that interacts between our Drupal website. Called the what? Uh, the Media Sherpa. Or actually, it doesn't go through the Drupal website at all. It, it's from Cablecast. And that's what takes the file and, and sends it over to archive. Media Sherpa. 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 Like, like a Sherpa. Like a Sherpa. Like a Sherpa. Like a Sherpa. Especially on Spell it for me. S H. I, I mean, it's that nothing that you can download yourself. I mean, it's something that only, it's just a tightrope thing. Right. Yeah. Sure. S H E R P A. Sherpa. Sherpa. So it's like sh basically schlepping your stuff to archive. <laughs> schlepping? What do you mean? Schlepping Sherpa. <laughs> That's my New York side. <laughs> Me and Sherpa. It almost seems like a reverse process because we're so used to uploading to our server first. Right putting it in that wrapper and then putting it out to the screen rather than sending it out to the you know cloud and then they're pushing it onto our server. Is that how this process no. no, no, well so not no this process is where go where we changed it in this this iteration of our tools actually it goes to archive and I mean sorry, it goes to the tightrope system and then that media sherper says, okay, here's a valid new file. It, you know, it's a unique ID it's not going to be up on archive, so it then it pushes it over to archive, and then archive does what Randy showed you: creates all the derivatives, takes whatever metadata is in the cable cast server with that file, all the metadata, and then creates that. And then once it's done, then the media server brings back that stream file and embeds it into the show page. So, so that this what I was showing you before. Uh, is it here? So. The file, once it's completely done, like it's okay by the um, the uh, tightrope, you get the producer gets to schedule your show option, so you know that that's good. And then when you get this file in here, this H264 embed code, then you know it's done. The archive process is done, and then this is totally the whole process is completely done at this point. Now, can the program play? So, so. Uh, I see the, the tightrope part of it, and then the Sherpa immediately sends it off after it's verified. Mm -hmm. So in that well, in after that the producer like ingests it. So that that's the last piece of this process, process that I haven't really explained yet. Okay. So basically, when someone ingests the show, the cablecast uh, system checks it. Once it's validated, then they come to our website instead of doing what Randy did on our archive site. They they have their own login on our site. They create, submit a new show. They get this show page. 
they choose a, one of their projects that they've created, right? These are just, I'm seeing everything because I'm an administrator. Um, and then they select the file. So these files in here are all files that have been validated by the cable cast and are ready to actually be submitted to our site and to go off to the archive. So once I create my file here, create my show title, the same thing that Randy did, you know, I put this in here, test, description, test, and then you can put in whatever information, episode number, um, I'm putting my licensing on this side of it, um, our theme blocks, our genres, so all these are our things that we require and then they're translated into, you know, some field on the archive form that Randy so they don't have to do that process twice. So all of the stuff that we want here, local, not local. Um, if you want to put the producer, email, credits, production company, all that stuff, then you hit save. And once you hit save, that's what triggers it going off to archive. Because then all the data is there um, to send over. And the uh, actual data these file. folks wouldn't have to do the same system. They could probably <laughs> use the the media, the internet archive, to just archive their shows separate from playback. You guys have just integrated playback with uploading to the archive. Yeah, well, and that's why we have so many shows is because it's right. part of our process, yeah, a required exactly. part of our process. We don't have to say, oh, we're going to like hire someone or we're going to get an right. intern and then we have two shows up in two years. Like, you have, it's like if you don't make these things part of your process, they won't do it. If you just tell your members, oh, you could do this as a second option, they won't do right, it. Right. So that's why it's this so important for us to incorporate this and process. It's automated. And it's all so automated. You have to take separate steps. There. If you want to, you can. Yeah. I mean, and the, so the other cool thing is, so you saw that like on our collection, in the, in the community media collection, it says open media project. Um, it's not, you know, the whole thing is that we want a lot of different stations using these tools um, to make that automated. So we have um, Berkeley Community Television, they have their own collection as well. And they're, so they have this site that looks just like ours, they have all their shows here, but they have their own collection. And with BETV, to, and this is to answer some of your guys' questions, they do not have 200 terabytes of RAIDs like we do. They don't have a technical staff. They have no idea how to deal with storage. And they have they only have so much storage just in their playback server that every year they have to completely wipe out their cable pass system because they don't have enough space. So the archive now that they've switched to the system is their permanent storage solution. It's the only storage solution that they have. And because you get that MPEG-2 that's a broadcast quality, that's the ACM server standard, they can always go back if some producer says, hey, I want to like air my show from two years ago. You just click on it, pull it down, and boom, it's ready to go back on your playback system. That's what I seem to do. I don't do websites, but we have a pretty antiquated website. But it basically, what you're going to do is take an embed, embed codes from the, like an embed, embed HTML from archive and putting it on your website. Mm -hmm. So that no storage required, you just take that embed HTML and put it on your yeah, the only storage is the metadata that's in that show, you know, whatever's in that show page, but none of the video content on that show page. So it's a, it's a, that's why it's a quick loading page. It doesn't actually load the video, it just loads the embed and okay. the link to archive. Thanks. One of you at the beginning also was concerned about um, backing up, you know, having an addition. Yeah, you're so, concerned about that? Right. You might mention, how many places on the planet is this thing backed up? Uh, by the Internet Archive. Well, they guarantee, well, they don't guarantee. There's, there's three uh, information. The, the video storage is replicated in three different data centers, at least three, and there's actually more like five. But uh, San Francisco, Amsterdam, and Alexandria, Egypt, the, the new library of Alexandria has a copy of the Internet Archive. So you've got, you've got that geographic distribution. and. I'm going to cover how you can back up. If you don't trust the archive, you can wind up having a cheap solution of backing up your shows and metadata from the archive on a consumer NAS device that will cost you about maybe 100 bucks what's the cost of drivers. So is that like, I mean, instead of doing one file at a time, I mean, as a backup, usually it's just a drag and drop of it's like a batch. Yeah, yeah. This, that, this thing is every time a new show, it, it, it acts off of a RSS feed 
for your collection. So anytime something new comes into your collection, this thing that's totally independent goes down, it just pulls it down. And so a four terabyte consumer hard drive will cost you 150 bucks. Actually, less than that. Well, that's, that's equivalent to the storage in your really fancy storage server. So that's a way of having a cheap copy. It doesn't need to be in the same center where your thing is. It can be at your house on a fast cable modem because you're using download bandwidth, not upload bandwidth. But that's, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to cut into Ann's time. I, want to let her I had a question. Uh, the media Sherpa, is that a purchasable item from Tyro, or is that something you have to um, call Ray You have to say, ask Ray. I mean, right now it's just meant to work with the open media system. So, like, um, BET have a, has a, uh, Gilroy and Santa Cruz is going to have it because it's part of, like, the open media tools. I don't know if it would work outside of that system, so you would have to ask Ray about that directly. Um, No, and you know what, we've <laughs> John and I were talking about this last night about bitrate, and we have honestly uploaded 60 gigabit shows to archive. They, they ask. It's like it insane. It, like, it takes like a day for it to come back. But. Well, they, they prefer you not to upload yes. more than files of 10 gig in size. <laughs> but if you're doing government, an MPEG of a huge. Yeah, but if you're doing an MPEG of a government meeting and the, the budget crisis it lasts five yeah. hours, mm -hmm. you're going to have a 15 anything. So what happens is they shuffle around in their data center between hundreds of computers and when they've got those large files, it limits the number of places that they can shuffle that file to. Right. So it, it's, it's, there's no hard limit, but it's a recommendation that you not use files larger than 10 gigs. Yeah, um, oh, one other benefit I just want to mention on here that's really cool for for our members is that even though like most of our members just interact on our website and don't actually see kind of like behind the curtain, um, some of our more savvy members definitely know that and they come here and on our website we have voting, we have, you can see um, the number of views that a show has, um, but on here you can actually see the number of downloads. So it's like another way to measure distribution, how, um, you know, what kind of how popular your content is, if other stations might be using it. And if you go up to the top of that page, you can sort it by downloads in your collection. So over on the right hand side, download count, sort, whoops. Oh, whoops. I see. So over on the right hand side, sort by download count. There, okay. These wow, guys are, this one is 54,000 They're gaming like, the system. This is a religious, is this the religious No, show? this is a just, it's a, okay. um, like a lawyer show. It was actually our top voted show. Yeah. Like two years running. Yeah, so archive on downloads, it's one click per IP per day. That's how they stop people from gaming the system and clicking, you know, having all their friends click on the links. One click per IP per day. A download is the same as a view. You can't tell if they looked at it for 30 minutes or 30 seconds. Their model is a public library. They don't keep statistics on who, who's viewed stuff. They're really concerned about that. And now you'll notice that every link to the archive gets translated into an HTTPS link. So it's they've enabled encryption, end-to-end -end encryption from your computer to them by default. So the NSA, who's capturing traffic, your ISPs can see what you're looking at on the Internet Archive, but they don't keep logs and they can't see it by sniffing the traffic they, because the, the request itself Okay, so there's a piece here that I still this is a little foggy, and that is okay. So uh, media shirt is not a purchasable module. So short of that, does that mean that we would need to refer to Randy's process? No. So that's what John's, John's I, John's I'm talk concerned about, about yes. how to get. I'm concerned about because I, I know about the tightrope doing the verify. Okay, but then at that verify, after it's verified, how does it get out? Is that something that I have to turn and then do every day? Yes. I, I, would I yes. do it as and a batch you, function? Yes. Then you either do it in batch or in manual, but it's up to you. There's a mul there are multiple ways of doing that. Okay. I'll cover one method of doing that. 
So the, the last thing I just want to show is also we manage also the Colorado channel, so it's like the local, the state C-SPAN, and we've got them to actually get into the archive process as well. So they're using basically a different version of the same Drupal tools that we're using. And so this is I think, the Colorado channel's website. Um, you can just click on archive sessions. This is available you know, for the community to see everything that happened within our state and um, Senate hearings, or um, House of Representative hearings. And as you can see here, this is actually the, it says the download, and this is the link for the download. So you can see that this is coming right from archive.org right here. So it's the AI archive.org right here. So I mean, it's something that it's not it's not just for public access stations. Government stations should be using this as well. This is important public records that should be available in perpetuity for the community to have. Um, so just, you know, basically, you know, it's been a great benefit for us. I mean, we can't even imagine any other way of, of doing things at this point. There's no way we would do it without our pet that word. Um, so it just, it just has a lot of benefits. And I hope you all choose to use it. So if you guys have any questions afterwards or ever want to talk to me outside of this session, please feel free to, to just email me. And I hope we the foundation. Good. Okay, and by the way, the video I uploaded is now there. You can watch it. Um, here's the Android version of it. So it's pretty quick. It's there and ready to be uh, shared with people. So all right, now uh, John, get ready to be blown away by what this guy can tell you. What's the matter, John? My cord, my cord's too short. Do, are you about to die? No. Oh, okay. So, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, that link takes you to these slides. It also takes you to where I archive all my presentation stuff. It's also information that I use. It's my brain dump. So I don't remember this stuff anymore, so I kind of keep going back there. Uh, let's see if we go. Is that a zero between the It's a zero, things? yeah, it's a zero. So if we go to, uh, <laughs> segment about the Internet Archive. Every one of you should look at this, and once you look at it, you should pass it to your executive directors, to your board members, your stakeholders, for everyone that is in that question of, should we partner with Archive versus somebody else? Go watch that documentary, because it talks about the mission of universal access to all human knowledge. You can see how the shared values of this nonprofit organization mirror the values of you and your access center. They're really supportive of open media. They love uh, community media access. So, which link was that documentary? Sorry, my eyes. It's this second one right here. It's also embedded in the slides where if you've got the PDF version of the slides, you can click on the underlined links. They'll take you to the same place that these, this will. All right. But this guy is a producer. Uh, I think he's out of New York City. And this is only one of the segments in his documentary. It's the only one he's got finished. It's professionally done. It's a great introduction to the archive. There's also a link called URLs of Interest and Search and RSS feed examples. Those are things, those are examples of advanced search links. And as I said, I wind up, they're my cheat sheets. I can't remember what the URLs for the, that I need are. So those links are useful. And then we've got other presentations I've done uh, with other information. So that's that's that link on that main. That's community. Yeah, and so this is what you're remembering. So your Google Food, community media 
archive wiki, community media archive wiki. You just type those words in, and that page will come up. Okay. here is that we started out because we didn't have enough bandwidth to do video on demand. We got into archiving and created the community media archive and said if we have to solve it for ourselves, let's solve it for other access centers. So we partnered with the archive. But there's something better than archiving and it's distribution. Every one of you needs quality non-commercial content produced by other local by other access centers. This idea that we're really working against ourselves. Our localism winds up separating us. If you think about the videos that your members produce, they cross uh, geographic lines. You know, they're issues of human interest, of importance to your members as well as their members. And so I've been starting to think about, now that we've got the archive in Finn Mayo and we're up to scale, now I'm working on kind of search and distribution, using the archive as a hub of a distribution system for local access stations. The other point here is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Don't go into this thinking that it's a project that you're going to get done with. It's something that do it low key, make it part of your production process. We've got one center in Worcester, Massachusetts that's got over, they're coming up on 4,000 items. Every one of those things has been uploaded manually. They've automated nothing. So. All, and they've had six different people do this over the years. They've been archiving since 2004. So the point is that you don't need to go automated, high tech. That's thousands of dollars and multiple years of experience. I'd almost rather you start out, I recommend everybody start out uploading their videos manually, getting experience with how the information that you put into that form reflects on the archives search interface. So that way, you can learn over time. It, it's taking time for you to get your learnings, but you're not doing 5,000 videos, then realizing that you did it wrong or you could have done it better. So do it slow, act as if it's a marathon. And the point is, you can do it. We've got over 40 centers now contributing to this thing. So it's not, you're no longer an early adopter. There's information, you can wind up talking to other stations that you see there about how do you do things. So it's no longer just me having to do this. In Chicago last year, there were four other presentations on the internet that, that mentioned the internet archive. And I was sitting in the back of a room just smiling, going, now I can move on to the next thing, which is search, because every year I have to do the intro session, and when I try and put an intermediate or advanced session in, the conference committee says, no, jam them together. Well, the reason why I've separated them is because of feedback from presentations. We've got communities with collections that want that intermediate stuff. So again, we'll try and shove 40 pounds of stuff into a five pound sack. Uh, this, I'm not gonna go over this other than the fact that there are over 10 million items on the Internet Archive. The goal is universal access to all knowledge, and there's the link to the documentary that I talked about earlier. Community Media Archive was started about five years ago. We've got about 26,000 items in there. 1.3 million downloads to date, which is either downloads or views, and 42 terabytes of original video files, not derivative formats. Here's the diagram of growth in terms of number of items. It's like the hockey stick. If you were an investor, you'd want to see growth like this. <laughs> so the point is, it's getting traction. More and more people are starting to do it more and more people are starting to not only contribute their current video, but they're starting to go into archiving projects. They're starting to look at that backlog that everybody has, the tape library. There's state, there may be state funding available in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm working with Amherst Media, which is the first organization in the state to get Community Preservation Act money and apply that to archiving the video of 30, so they're archiving the they're preserving the cultural history of their community as shown by that, uh, by what their members, through the view of their members. Uh, there's also the National Archives, uh, the Federal National Archives is now starting to do presentations at uh, conferences at ACM or 
regional conferences. And now you've got somebody who's the director of the National Archives saying, access centers are the repository of the community's cultural history. And here's the bad news. And then she goes on to say, and you have a responsibility to preserve that history. Okay, another unfunded mandate. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that now you've got a recognition at the federal level of our history, you know, we've been around 30, 40 years, and now there's starting to be dollars in certain cases for those kind of projects. So we, I talked about this briefly. The goal that I had for the Community Media Archive was I wanted a collection where broadcast quality, locally produced shows, with enough information so that people can find and share them, and that there aren't restrictions on sharing them. The model of the Internet Archive is a public library. If you've got anything, if you've got any model in mind where you want some people to get access to it, but not others, you want people to be able to stream it, but not download it, go somewhere else, it's not gonna work. Tiered access, you know, everybody gets in these tricky schemes, it's not gonna work. If it's not public, it doesn't belong on the Internet Archive. So they're not the right person as a partner, if you're thinking that way. So that's a goal, you know, and that's a that's a worthy goal because it's doing something for you. You can wind up doing archiving and helping your center and your community, and that's good. But this next part of the vision is now let's talk about how we share this stuff between Access Center using the archive as a hub and a distribution system. And again, we want the broadcast quality up there because we don't want everybody to have to be transcoding locally. That's insane. We want one copy up there, and that's MoBeta. Now we've got people not only archiving, but they're careful about what they put in their metadata, so now it's usable, it's reusable by other access centers. So the question about how we get started, all you need is an email and a password. There's the link that takes you to the upload. It's just the, it's on the main page. It's the little upload button, but that's the, uh, I'm sorry, that login page will get you if you haven't registered on the archive, that's the login page where you can set up. On, on, on the main page, there's a login button. Yeah, that's all it is. It's, it's the same thing. So the question about how you get a collection, you email the collections group, you need to give them the title of your collection, your logo and descriptive information, you request that it be a sub-collection of the community media archive, you give them the addresses you want to add in, and then if you want to, that special magic I talked about, you request the MPEG-2 derivative. And what that means is if you shove a file up that's not an MPEG-2, Archive will transcode it in that ACM server standards working group format so that it's guaranteed to be playbackable by any, uh, by any of the major server vendors on equipment in the last six years. And the reason we do that, the reason we did that is because four years ago, the crap we were getting out of pegmedia.org, 70% of those MPEGs would error out on trying to import them into our Princeton. Mm -hmm. So in our access center, whenever we download stuff from the web, and we do a lot of it, we've automated a lot of it, we automatically run that through a transcode process before we try and import it. Because it just wasn't worth it to have the programming person trying to import shows and being running into these errors because right. you want to, you know. So we guarantee that when we download stuff from the web, it's ingestible. And that's what the server standards do. Yeah. So, so sorry, you just said it, I gotta ask. I, the new hypercasters from, from Telview, they won't take a, a, a regular MPEG-2. It's an MPEG-2 transport stream. So we have to transcode in the first place. Is okay. that is that is that right? I mean, it's so what the derivative you're talking about is an MP, MP2 straight, it's not a transport stream or anything like that. That's my understanding. Okay. And Telview is one of those folks that I tried to work with them for three and a half years, and it looked good at the start, and basically I've given up trying to work with them. They decided to go with their new technology stack and shifting their head to in a proprietary in a proprietary way. So. I'm done, you know, I'm done worrying about Telview. I still have, we still have Telviews, but we have the old crappy you stuff. Old yeah, we have the, B, the B3000, the B1000, and I don't have the kind of money to play in their new uh, levels of equipment. 
I don't, it's just not an option. I have no capital. Okay, so there's some concepts. When you think about the archive, there's some concepts and some words that you have to get straight. Collection, item, identifier, and file. Every one of them means what you think it means. A collection is a collection of items. An item has an identifier. Files get uploaded to item. <laughs> Here's the rub. Item identifier must be unique across all items in the archive. So you can't, that means you can't upload a video called, let's call it Loose Cannon, with something that our producer produced a show called Loose Cannon. I tried to upload it to the archive. Bang! Uh -uh. I didn't have the rights to use that identifier because somebody had already used it. I couldn't change the metadata, I couldn't upload the show. What if you call it Loose Cannon Volume 2? That's great, right? Until somebody does that before you, and now you're loose cannon 999. So what I recommend is that you put a, a prefix on your videos. We wind up using AH, dash, um, and anybody that I work with does that, whether it's upper or lower case, I don't care. But that way, the other way you wind up getting a unique name is if you're coming off the tightrope, do they still use those prefixes on the show IDs? Yeah, it's unlikely that you're going to have a namespace collision with some other access center with the exact same show ID dash got a name right so you don't have to worry about it but visually to have you've got 10 million items in the archive when you're looking at a listing of them don't you want to be able to tell by looking at the item whether it's one of yours or not so that prefix like ah dash or something like that uh, denver uses dom seattle community media uses their software it's scm uh, when we did the archiving project for Somerville, we used their SCAP TV, it was their prefix, so we used SCAP TV that. So that's how, now you've only got a namespace collision in the number of items, so Access Humboldt only has to worry about the 4,000 items in our collection. And we get namespace collisions, especially when those producers wind up coming up with a second version of the show that's five seconds longer on the credit roll, and you know, it winds up going up again and bang. We get a collision, but that's then we go through for a like ten people ingesting words of peace. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a good point. We don't wind up uploading non locally produced content. So any of the nationally distributed stuff, we won't upload it. It's just our policy. The world doesn't need another copy of Words of Peace mm -hmm. up there mm -hmm. in the archive. Oh, wow. There's already there's already versions of there. <laughs> so in our process we have an okay for web distribution checkbox on our submission form. So the producer gives us permission to upload it to archive versus to just play it out on our system. And only about 60% of our producers allow us to upload to archive. The other 40% are kind of old and don't know what archive is. Okay, wait, wait, hold on. Okay, so <laughs> he just rocks his world. So in your process, you have an okay to upload. O okay for web distribution. Okay for web history, but okay, so what if, because a lot of my clients are going to say okay for web distribution, but prior to that you have a, a, a stipulation about lo only locally produced content. Is eligible for no. this? He, we have, this, is this, is yeah, this is a policy. This is a policy. Station by station policy. Right, I understand. Created. I understand. Yeah, we have a very different Cause, policy cause than what they have. I understand. Because we have Prim Rawat as well. Okay, so I get that. Uh, and now that I'm hearing, you guys, I didn't know you guys had Prim Rawat. <laughs> so, English and Spanish. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, so you decide beforehand, or is that a negotiation with the, with the provider saying, look, it's got to be locally produced before we consider it for yes. Okay, yes. that's what. Yeah, I'm yeah. That's that thing is is first. Okay. We what we're trying to do is we're trying to showcase the the locally produced content through this thing. Right. Producers, Randy notwithstanding, um, producers have a lot of outlets for uploading their stuff. Right. So this was really when we started. This was the vision was really the access center, the community media archive. That was what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to do something that solved distribution for anyone. anyone. Yeah, so that's why we put that uh, in there. Yeah, and we don't, we don't actually do that. We, 
we have everybody upload everything. It's all automated. Um, but I mean, and we, we we actually this is something that we differ on as well. We require a Creative Commons license at our station, um, especially. We can make exceptions if you're not using the equipment that was provided through the PEG fund, but if you use our equipment provided to free, for free by the PEG fund, we require, we believe uh, wholeheartedly that people should, you know, if they're using equipment for free, that they should give back their creative ideas to the community, and there's no reason it shouldn't be distributed, and that they can have some strict hold on distribution of that content, especially if it's a non-commercial use at other public access centers. And three years, it, just in the last three years, the Creative Commons organization has gotten way better in terms of educational information. So when we started out, we didn't know enough about Creative Commons to be able to tell producers anything. Mm -hmm. So it's only been in the last, and so Denver was at one end of the continuum and we were at the other end in terms of requiring Creative Commons. Now as we're kind of educating, our, as, as we get more comfortable with it, as our producers get more comfortable, um, we wind up encouraging Creative Commons, but again, we've got 75, 85 year old producers who are still giving us VHS tapes. Um, so we don't try, we can't, God, we need as many submissions as possible, we don't want to hold them. <laughs> so that's our perspective on, on that. Um, getting back to this about the item level, the item level is really where it all happens. That's where you get your details page, that's where your metadata lives. So, so the real model is one file, one item. You really don't, don't go sticking a hundred, don't go using the item for a series and have episodes as separate files under that series because then you can't have it, nobody can drill in on just one thing. Create a separate item for each episode. And let's see, uh, okay, the next slide is how do I upload files? That first link using the manual interface is what Randy showed. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everybody, don't even think about automating it until you wind up getting a sense. You've uploaded some things, you see how the, the information you put in the form winds up showing up on their, uh, on their pages. The point here is that there's a bulk uploader available. It's a program that takes comma separated value files for metadata, and there's a link to an example. You click on that thing, it'll show you what I'm talking about. So that's an example. You can't read this, but it's just a spreadsheet. And so there's there's a bunch of columns here. There's only four or five of the columns that are required, but file, runtime, item, creator, media type, collection, title, description, license URL. That was the thing that uh, Randy, just by clicking on their upload, he chose the Creative Commons thing and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. What that does is it actually creates the, it creates the license URL that points to the Creative Commons site so that on your item, you get the little graphic with the appropriate things X'd out or added in that tells people graphically what the license is. But the way you specify that to archive.org if you're using a, a batch process, is you actually use the URL of the appropriate license. And then subject, I've got five subject fields here. And they're all they're really doing, they're kind of being overloaded. So it's the name of the access center, it's where the access center is, it's the state the access center is in, and then we're using one of the subject fields as the series name, and then we've got the year split out as the subject. And the reason why you do that is because you're just overloading that field so that you can wind up uh, in this browse by subject keyword on the archive. And again, you can skin this website, you can front end the archive with your own website like how they did. But if you're too cheap or too poor, you can use this, in the archives interface. And now you've got, you can see you've got a list of shows by year by doing that. You've got series in this thing. You, you shoved series into a subject tag and so now in this subject keyword, you can go to uh, Adler Update. There's 229 shows so far in this. This, by the way, is I went to Massachusetts and a guy handed me a four terabyte drive with 1,800 shows. And we're uploading right now. I'm in the middle of uploading that. I've got about 800 done so far. And if you want to look at what the batch upload process looks like, you've seen what the 
file look like that describes the game. And if we go to here, that's it. So you see that here's the file name from the spreadsheet. It's going into this place on archive, and then it just sits there and waits and you know, it sits there and uploads it, and then you get a, a code that says whether it's uploaded or not. This thing actually, if, if you run into problems on archive, this thing, this program will actually retry it for a certain number of retries because sometimes the archive just gets broken and they, they slow down and they stop their ingest rate of people sending videos. But this thing, the next time you fire it up, it knows what you've uploaded and it just retries. Is that my misreading? Are these files huge? They're huge. They're all MPEG files. They're, they're two to four gigs a piece. 1,800 files, there's 3.7 terabytes on there that we're uploading. We're uploading them, oh, this is another point. When you've got a project like this, you do not upload 1,800 files at once. I split them into 100. I've got a process that splits them into batches of 100, and I upload and monitor that 100 at a time. So we're about halfway through the process. Nick, uh, technical questions, because you brought up the bulk uploading. Uh, <laughs> we'll find it here, we'll talk. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, it, it, it's fine. I'll you're, more, you're more technical than I am, but all I wanted to show you here was this graph. This is a network traffic graph of all the servers that are involved at Access Humble. This is our connection through the education and research network. It took us three and a half years to get this connection, three college vice presidents. We upload to archive through a link to our community college. We, can, we, can, we have a 100 megabit connection to the community college for uh, broadcasting sports, for broadcasting classes. The Internet Archive is not only a 501c3 foundation, they're a, they're a federal depository library, they're an educational institution, and so therefore traffic from us through the California Education and Research Network is allowed. It's, we're, not, we're not going to YouTube, we're not going to one of these commercial sites. Right. We're going from an access center to an educational institution as classified by CNET. So we're, we've been, this batch upload has been running for several days and this last, last batch I started at 11 o'clock at night and it's still running. I'm running 200, two batches at a time. And that 7.2 meg, that's a big, meg, big M, big B. So that's 72 meg a second is what I'm averaging on upload to that connection. And it's the sort of thing that I just check in every now and then and see that things are things are still rolling along on that. So we put out, a couple of years ago, people had issues about bandwidth, about uploading. The other barrier to uploading was technical knowledge. So I made an offer at the 2009 national thing that said, we'll work with you to get your video uploaded to archive. What you need to do is you need to be organized. And somebody said, well, how much does it cost? I said, well, I don't know, but the less organized you are, the more it's going to cost. <laughs> so that person turned out to be the director of Somerville, and she actually wound up handing me a hard drive. She would had an intern do the metadata spreadsheet, and the first the first hard drive with about 800 shows went up pretty easily. Then she did a second uh, hard drive. That was an <coughs> intern, and the point was she had had such a good experience that she wasn't supervising that second intern because the first intern did so well. I wound up spending over 10 hours cleaning up the metadata on that second hard drive, but now Somerville has a collection of 1,000 shows up there from 1984 to 2014, they just celebrated their 30th anniversary this year. And now you've got that. It's really neat because now it's a pilot of that snapshot of the community's cultural history over 30 years. And so that's, we're getting more and more of that at this point. Um, we have four minutes left, so I will have a half hour to life, so you don't have to kick it all out of room at left. So let's see, go back to, let me just see what's left on the, you can go ahead and, we've covered most of these things. Uh, the only point here is, 
What's it? Oh yeah, I hate, I hate the word best practices. We're, we're public television, you know? So it's a pretty good practice, but it's not best practices. Um, we wind up putting a custom, this is one thing I didn't say, but it's, it's assumed. Archive requires very little in the way of metadata or descriptive information. You saw that there were only about three or four fields on that form that Mandy required. <coughs> they will take anything. And I encourage you to push everything you have to archive. You don't want to get into the situation that Denver got into where all their video was on archive, but after they changed their website, their metadata was over on their website, and the two are the, the two weren't connected now. So we're gonna wind up fixing that with Denver. And so you want to push what you have. Since they're, they'll take anything you have. And you, the way you do that is you wind up creating an element name in your, either your spreadsheet or your upload. There's no presenter element that Archive has. We created one just by creating a column called presenter. So now we can search on Archive. We say, show us everything that Randy Van Dalson contributed. And it comes back. We wouldn't be able to do that otherwise. So presenter is what we call the person who submitted the show. We only allow locally produced content, so it's not the person who's fronting for the national organization. It's actually the person who created. Yeah, so it would be producer in another uh, example. Um, include a series metadata element. The biggest failing of archive is that video, even though it's growing in importance, it's still a stepchild of the archive. These guys are, you know, they started out archiving texts. Brewster is a book fanatic. So the whole point is that they're focused on librarian in the old kind of libraries. With video, the series is something that really is important. Over 75% of the shows of the major collections in the community media archive belong to a series. So start tagging series, start tagging them as series, because then you can start doing really cool things with automated things that say, as a programming person looking for non-local content, you do the same thing you've done any place else, is you say, I've got, okay, I've seen this thing, it's good enough quality, it's compelling enough, our members are gonna wind up enjoying it. I'll take, whenever the next episode comes down, gets a put up to archive, I want it. And you can do that if they're serious. Otherwise, your programming person is gonna have to sit there and scan, and nobody's gonna be scanning those 28,000 items. So, Sorry, is that because of the RSS feed? You can set your you can set your device to, yeah. to to listen for that RSS for yeah. that series name and yeah. then pull it down. Okay. That's it. Thank now you. you can also I shouldn't be telling you this, but because we put series in subject name, you can also say subject equals and then that series name that you're putting in the subject field, you can do the same thing. Okay. The subject field overloading is really used to take advantage of the archives interface. This is more uh, an automated, thinking about automated exchange in the okay. future. Um, please include a runtime in hours, minutes, seconds format. If you put it in that way, it'll display that way. It'll make it easier for the person. I mean, you know, you've seen stuff on a website that looks interesting, but you have to click on it to get the, the bar to tell you how long it is. <laughs> we don't download anything less than it takes us to screen scrape the metadata for it and stick it into our system. <coughs> so we don't wind up bringing in four minute videos from uh, from the web. Consequently, you want to know if it is it under 28 minutes or is it over two hours? And so putting that, infor putting that information right on your details page is helpful. We, we've covered these things, which is just using multiple subject elements. Uh, okay, how can I help? You, you guys are jazzed, and so now you're thinking, oh yeah, I want to contribute my video to the archive, you know? <laughs> Improve the metadata of your items. That's the number one thing. And what you're doing with that is you're answering the question, how will somebody find this item in this vast sea of video out there on the archive? Take the time to learn Internet Archive's interfaces. There's an advanced search interface, there's an edit item interface, an item history interface, an item manager interface, and in this program, that's the bulk uploader. And I've got links to all these things in the link from the Community Media Archive Wiki. And then you can also help underwrite work on the distribution aspect. Um, Sean McLaughlin, the executive director of Access Humble, 
winds up paying me for a little bit less than half of the time that I spend on this, but I wind up donating the rest of the time. So if you're interested in kind of working on how do you wind up getting this automated sharing system between centers, you're going to wind up saying, hey, we want to we want to bring you in, help us on our archiving project, or we want to fund part of the part of furthering that goal. Uh, thanks to Bruce here in the archive, to Sean and Access Humble, uh, to the Access Centers, and then the digital, we didn't talk about this at all, but 10 years ago in Massachusetts there was an effort called Digital Bicycle that was started. And so the idea was bicycling tapes between access centers was getting kind of old, especially in the winter time. <laughs> and so they had this idea about using BitTorrent because 10 years ago BitTorrent was kind of the new cool right. technology. So these little access centers in Massachusetts were thinking they were going to be able to do this. Every one of those 28,000 items on archive has a torrent file. So you can wind up pulling down just by, just by grabbing the torrent file, you can wind up grabbing the broadcast quality video, the other derivatives, and the metadata file. And so that's something, I've got some details <coughs> on that. But you know, the point is, let's try and go for that double good instead, you know, instead of just solving your own archiving problem, let's look past that and get to distribution. Because through this method of using the Internet Archive, you're using the same method for both. So your archiving solution isn't separate from helping build a distribution solution. And then these slides, the Community Media Archive wiki, and then my email address. Okay, questions? Okay. Yeah. So I think we have a hypercast as well for transport streams and stuff. Huh? So the best thing for us to do, especially to start out with the non-batch program, just one by one or whatever. So I'll take the original, encode it on our workplace, a WB encoder, put it into this, put our encoded MPEG 2 into the Teleview system, and then take the original and then put that on on the archive.org and let them have the MPEG 2 with that. Is your is your original higher quality than the MPEG 2? <coughs> is it an MPEG 4? Not necessarily. No. Okay. Um, or just, just upload the MPEG-2 and then have no original. The MPEG-2, just, just so I can, I can answer here, because yeah. we do some of the same process. The MPEG-2 that we end up using on our servers, 3.75 megabits per second mm -hmm. at, AC3, at, at AC3 audio standard. So um, I don't know what the MPEG-2 derivative that you use on our code is, right. but that's what we would be uploading if we uploaded the broadcast server gotcha. standard. Yeah. We can also, though, however, th this is what I was going to ask you before, which is, um, does does she get, or does Denver Open Media get a uh, an, um, a publishing point to their collection that they then use for their automated process? Because we have this thing called, um, you may have one or not, uh, called a, a Turbo Workflow Accelerator. Yep. And that what that does is that makes an H.264 file and then publishes it to a specific um, publishing point, and it includes a CSV with the metadata in it. And so that we could, we may be able to use that in some way to automate the upload process if the H.264 would be high enough quality, which we can set, by the way. We can set the bit rate of the H.264. Yeah, that would be my one question. If it's, if it's meant for web distribution, it may not be high enough quality, but if it, but if it is, and, and we can wind up. Okay. We can wind up talking. To you but is there is there a, in other words, does Denver Open Media have a publishing point that gets those files to that collection, or are they just using a a version of the of the bulk uploader? He's talking about the servo. Yeah, kinda. I didn't want to use the word again. I didn't <laughs> use the word. Sorry, but I mean. But I mean, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out what it sounds like the Sherpa does is it, it, it publishes to a publishing point on archive.org that's unique to Denver Open Media. It's the collection. collection. You, yeah, you have, to, you have to get into the Internet Archive. You, you have to wind up understanding the Internet Archive thing first, first, which is why I recommend that you do it manually because there's a standard format for a URL in the archive. So it's archive.org details, item identifier, that's it. So when you're uploading, all you're providing is the, the only thing that changes is the identifier name. 
and that has to be unique across 10 million items. And so the internals of your process have to wind up, uh, you're actually pointing at an S3 uh, series of servers to, to point to, but wherever you point to, your item is going to come out at this URL, and your UR and that's and that's determinable. You know where the, the resulting thing is. The same thing that you're uploading, you're uploading to the same point that I'm uploading to. You have different credentials doing it, and your credentials are associated with your collection name. Does that help? Yes. So it's okay. so we upload to the same place. Everybody uploads to the same URL. Their IDs are different. And their collection so, so the username and password used to upload identifies with your collection. Yes. And if you can use those credentials within your automated process, yes. then you can point to the correct collection. And Archive has re reverse engineered Amazon's S3 storage process. You don't need to know that. Right. If you have tools that work with it, say that work with Amazon S3, you can put the Archive credentials in there. You can change the URL, and it just works. Mm -hmm. yep. yes. Okay, I'm going way back. Yeah. We <laughs> had a room full of tapes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Workflow process. We can ingest them, obviously, from one at a time, time real time, tape mm -hmm. playing. Yeah. We have a final cut. We have Premiere, yep. Media Encoder. In the what would be the best? I mean, you can batch intro overnight kinds of things yep. that people aren't working. What compression do you recommend to get the best quality from the in, SD tapes? In this link here, the, the ACM 2013 presentation session links, there's a document that was done by Somerville. Let's see. <clears throat> Where is it? Wendy, Wendy Blom's case study of Somerville Community Access TV. That's a six-page document with the process that they went through to convert the tapes, it shows screenshots of the programs that they used, showing the resolutions. So I would start with that as, as the document <coughs> to, to look at. Um, it's, it's the other thing. It's a huge thing to go from tape. You guys are all kind of automation, but yeah. you don't automate. Right, know. exactly. But so that's, that would be another one of those slow processes where you try something and a certain set of resolutions, and then you look at it and you say, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> Or you well, might it would be good enough for the you know, download coming back, because some of the shows are great looking shows. I mean, they would be good for distribution, even though they're not HD. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, I'm but sorry. Yeah, it download. doesn't need to be HD. The reason Our I use HD is I'm looking for <coughs> at least something that's as good as an MPEG-2 file. And so H.264, <laughs> if, you're, if you're encoding into H.264 MPEG-4, you're going to get good quality at a much smaller file size. Mm -hmm. And so all you're doing is playing around with the sliders to see, does it look good? Right. And if it looks good, um, what we, I don't think, uh, these guys uploaded their, their MOV files to archive. And so they didn't upload MPEG-2 files. But then the conversion process that archive does to get the MPEG-2 yeah. for everybody else that didn't have to mm -hmm. But that's that's just something you put on your collection. That's a switch that you tell archive to throw. Right, you can do that, but that process, what looks the best? I mean, does, has anybody decided to do this and this will look the best for your show? I mean, there's a lot of different you can destroy things badly with encoding. I mean, I, I think you shouldn't worry about it too much, honestly. I mean, we've we don't part, there's like almost nobody, we have like one old woman that submits like two tapes a year, and that's it, everyone else is doing. Did you just doing, all the tapes you had from the We started fresh, because we didn't have an access center before 2006, so we didn't have to worry about that. Um, but, I mean, all we did for all those, the, some of the tapes that we did have from that, or people that do bring us tape, we just capture them in Final Cut, and, and put it down in the timeline, make sure it's clean, Export it just as you know, quick time conversion, DBNTSC, and 720 by 480. That's said. it. Boom. Yeah. Put yeah, it in DVD there. quality is basically what you're shooting yeah. with tapes in terms of. Them. And then we, you know, we've done that, and we do also MPEG Stream Clip, and then we had them do MPEG, uh, just MPEGs for a while. Then we had them do H.264s. I mean, it's really not that much difference noticeable unless you're getting really crappy small, like you're having them. 
maybe like a wave, like our WMV or something like that. Yeah, some really crappy stuff like that. But H two six four the DBNTSC or even like with HD stuff in Final Cut or in Premiere, uh, you export it as M, you know MP four or as even like in you know uh, like an HDV ten eighty I all that all that stuff works. All every, everything works. I mean, archive is very forgiving in what it takes, and you know, and if it looks bad. Then you just do something different, you know. It's, yeah. Especially if you're starting off by We're just not, doing a couple at a time. We're not We're trying to add it. your anxiety level by yeah. adding archiving as a task. Don't, yeah. you know, <laughs> this is do-it-yourself <laughs> archiving. You know, it's like it doesn't start small and it doesn't work. Yeah, okay. just don't stress about it and just you know use those processes. Yeah. So, so I can help a little bit on that question too because CTV is starting a tape-based process. We had a bunch of VHS tapes. I have something like 1,500 VHS tapes. It scares the crap out of me, honestly. Uh, I ha I'm glad I had interns, really. I, um, but uh, what, what, sort of the rule of thumb that we've tried to use is uh, whatever the MPEG-2 format is that, that archive ends up getting to, you want your bit rate to be higher than that to start out with because it's easier for, um, it's easier for archive to compress than it is to decompress because then you get less scoping and less macro blocking and all kinds of other craziness. So if, as long as you can have a, a, a bit rate, what is the bit rate of the MPEG-2 that, that derivative that's on our page? Let's say five. It can be, these guys use eight, but that's a waste of space for most things, so we use five. Okay. Uh, the TED Talks collection uses five. Five. Yeah, so, so constantly. So if you were at five, if your server is at five or above, when you take your server files or any, any encode process, if your, ser if your encode process is at five or above, then when archive does the derivative, it'll, it'll be compressing rather than decompressing, which is easy. If you go to denveropenme.org slash help, too, for our, just for our producers, we have like how to submit a video on a DVD or from Final Cut, and okay. just basic, you know, and that's just, we're, we're just pretty much having everybody do H.264 files now. 90% of our producers are submitting HD content, so we just have them do that, and if it's not, then they just you do the same thing, except for do it, you know, four by three, 720, instead of, but we still use H.264 now. John, we've got all these sub-collections to the community media um, collection, and those would include folks like their Open Media and everybody else. Can you, can some, someone set up sub-collections to a sub-collection? You're cute, but not that cute. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because we have a lot of places where um, hey, staff time ain't available to do this. What I'm thinking of, therefore, is is there a way for producers, like someone like as as deep as me, to upload within a collection or sub collection? I hope it's not. sub sub-collections aren't really sub-collections. You saw how the namespace was flat. Mm -hmm. So your collection is archive.org details media age. Right? It's not archive.org details community media archive media age. Sub-collections don't matter. Okay. So no, it's the difference between navigation and search. Nobody navigates to a video on the internet archive. They find it through a search engine or you send out a link. So that's why I'm constantly Navigating is the way we used to do it in the web in 1995, before search took over. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. The, the, the whole hierarchy thing is just to fake people out. To fake it. The people, people who are used to navigating, nobody's going to follow you know, five levels down to look at things. It, and the video is coming back. You only want to know what the URL is to get to the video back. Yeah. So it can be done a lot of different ways, but we haven't done producers doing their own stuff in their collection. Okay. Um, Dom does it where they wind up accepting the producer credentials and they do all the authentication so that they don't step on each other's shows. And then all that stuff goes up with one credential from the access. So the access center is, is the gate keeper to the community media archive collection. As a producer, you are not associated with the media center because you have your own media right, that's right, right. But if you put the media center in a subject, that would still 
one of the tags. You yes. can still get searched yes. by that. Yep. So yeah. And the that's how you would once it. once we open an account. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but even just the words. Like I could put like, right. like Yeah, you need an account to upload is what I'm saying. And you're saying that once you add a series account, name to right. yeah. That I could yes. and associate and with the media center with the tags. That brings up things like and as a producer, what I'm using this for is a way to not only have on, an on-demand archive of all of our programs, but also as a way to distribute those programs by simply, uh, every week, sending an email with folks saying, hey, the latest one is up, click here, I embed the link to the MPEG-2 download uh, into the email, and that's all our stations that are carrying the show have to do to download the show. So that's, and, and I really like the price point of all this too, because I'm like, Frank Media, I don't know what they would have used to charge or still charge, but this is no cost. Um, so. And, and just to add to that, I mean, the thing is, because we were looking at Peg Media when it first came out too, and it's like, it was such a mishmash of everything in there, and you didn't know what, what they didn't want to do any licensing. So, and I know that John has a slightly different stance on this, but we want Creative Commons licensing, so we know that it's okay to use, because if, if we start airing content, and someone comes and says, hey, why are you airing this? It's not, you don't have any permission, like, you know, some of the producers are very protective over their stuff, we're gonna get in trouble. But if, if you say, okay, think about what a Creative Commons license is, put it up there, then I know that I can air it with without any worry of, you know, legal action or problems or somebody even just getting pissed off because that Creative Commons license is there and I know if I'm not using it commercially or whatever the restrictions are, I can use it. So it's a really important piece of the distribution for all of our channels to have the, what's okay to use and not use in terms of what goes up there. Okay, are you less confused than when we started? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. What's the price point? Because the whole point, <laughs> the whole point with, you know, in this TV geeking thing, Randy came up with the name, right? I don't know. That was Shelly. <laughs> Shelly's the, Shelly came up with the name? Well, I had said I was willing to do a thing, and then I see the title, I'm going, TV Community Media Archive. I wonder who's doing that session. It's not me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of depth here. The point is you can take it like an onion and kind of peel layers back, and you learn over time, and you get more knowledgeable. And that's why I recommend starting out, even though you're enthusiastic, starting out slow, and making those incremental steps, building on your knowledge. Um, I hope to see all of you on the Community Media Archive. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.